why don't we rewind back a bit? There was one thing that I wanted to confirm. You said, and I meant to confirm it at the time. You were saying that at the time of the suffrage movement, there were more women who were against. Uh, there were there were more anti suffragettes than there were suffragettes. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Actually, by a large margin, a really large margin. So uh, another interesting thing that I found that I'm sure a lot of people aren't aware of is that they actually proposed referendums. So this is like a bit of irony for you. Uh, you know, the politicians of the time said, maybe we should have a few referendums and see, you know, what public opinion is on women's suffrage. Let's see uh, what happens if we give women the opportunity to vote on whether they want to vote. And it was so horrible. Uh, it was only about 4% of women even bothered to turn out and even less actually voted in favor of suffrage. Uh, that from that point on, um, suffragists actually blocked women's referendums. So it was actually the pro suffrage women saying, don't let the women vote on whether they want to vote. They would actually actively lobby and block women's referendums on voting. Yeah, so I mean, people listening might be wondering, like, okay, but why? Why would the women, you know, why would they oppose suffrage, you know? And I had mentioned earlier that you might think it was due to conditioning, but they actually had some incredible arguments. One of my things I'm trying to do is kind of bring some of the old anti-suffrage writings back to light, so we can hear from the other enormous uh, section of the women's population as to what their thoughts were on this at the time. And I have something here, and this is a, a like an anti-suffrage poster they made in New York um, in the 18, in 1915, this was. And this was a list of special privileges that New York women have secured under male suffrage that they didn't wanna lose. So they said, married women are, are not required to contribute to support a family. A woman may work, she may earn money and spend it as she pleases. She may own real and personal property and dispose of it or sell it without her husband's knowledge or consent. The husband cannot dispose of any real estate without the wife's consent. The wife cannot be required to pay the husband's bills even if contracted for support of family. The husband must pay the wife's bills, whether for the family or for her own personal expenses. If the wife obtains divorce, husband must pay alimony. If husband obtains divorce, even through the wife's fault, she pays nothing. Uh, the wife may have millions and cut her husband off without a cent. The husband cannot cut the wife off, even without dower right. Meaning uh, a wealthy woman could marry a poor man and he was still responsible for paying, her, paying for her and for the children. Um, and then it goes on to list a few more things, uh, including that women are exempt from military service and from jury duty and uh, that if the husband fails to support the wife he may be arrested and prosecuted criminally the wife cannot be compelled to support the husband under any circumstances no matter how rich she may be or how, how poor he may be so their argument was look for women to be mothers and child bearers they they need to have insured support right and we don't want to lose that so everything you said was what was already in place under male suffrage okay yes Yes. So this idea that women were horribly oppressed and had no choice and couldn't do anything. And they, you know, they were just beaten all the time and all these, these crazy things that have been blown drastically out of proportion or completely just um, fabricated, really. The women of the time who didn't want suffrage really valued motherhood and community. They were the people who were, um, you know, keeping the churches alive. They were the community organizers. They were the ones who took care of children orphans, the sick, the old, the infirmed, um, and they were very family oriented and they were very community oriented, which is something we've really lost now and we don't have anymore because the women are all in cubicles, right? So at this time, they felt very busy and very well occupied with all of these kinds of very important things that they were doing. And they said, look, we need reasonable assurance that men are going to support us if we're going to be the ones, you know, basically holding up this whole side of society with family and children and community. And if we have equal suffrage, we will just become another political block. We will just, we'll lose our moral high ground. That was another argument they had. They said, right now we're nonpartisan. We don't have to get into politics. We can be kind of the impartial 
uh, moral high ground of society that can look at things through a non-political lens. If we become fully enfranchised, we become just another voting block. We become just another taxpayer base and we lose the privileges and the protections that allow us to be mothers and community uh, caretakers and organizers. And that's exactly what happened. It's a lot. It, I get this like knee jerk reaction of why do you hate women? And it's not that way at all. Of course, I have four daughters. I'm a woman. Um, but a lot of people also don't realize that men's suffrage only came about just before women's suffrage. So uh, people have this impression that in the West, in a democratic or a republic, in you know, democratic republic in the West, that men, all men have always been able to vote. Totally untrue. Uh, up until 10 years before women got the vote in England, that's when men got the vote. The male universal suffrage only happened one decade prior to women's universal suffrage. Before that, only five to six percent of men in England could vote. Suffrage was limited. It was limited by, in a lot of ways, by age, by, you know, uh, profession or sometimes by religion or uh, citizenship. There was a bunch of different ways it was limited in different places and it varied but only about five or 6% of men could vote until 10 years before all the women could vote there. And in the United States, men got it a little sooner, but prior to the Civil War, it was only about four or 5% of American men who could vote. So all of these countries started with very limited suffrage and people have this impression that men have always been able to vote, men have always had all the freedom and women have just been screwed for all of history. So a lot of what I do is try to go back and look at things in context mm -hmm. and actually explain how it really was because the version we've gotten has been this rewritten version because of standpoint history. So standpoint feminism.